begin the dramatization of the ghetto kidnapping case, it is our great pleasure to present a man who played an important role in the peace army which tracked down and captured the ghetto kidnappers. Ladies and gentlemen of America, a message from Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. I have just returned from San Diego by special plane to be here tonight and to compliment law enforcement heads of this county upon the fine work accomplished in apprehending the ghetto kidnappers and sending them to San Quentin for life, all within 46 hours. Quick justice such as this will keep Southern California clean of kidnappers. As chief of police, it has been a source of great pride to me to see the marvelous cooperation between the various law enforcement agencies concerned in the capturing the criminals who kidnapped Mr. Gettle. Hand in hand, the police department, the sheriff's department, and the federal forces have labored without rest until Mr. Gettle has been returned to his family and the criminals locked in jail. Against such cooperation, no criminal on earth can survive. Together, they staged the biggest manhunt in the history of the Southwest, and together, they got their man. Now, may I introduce to you a man who has worked as hard to bring this case to a happy conclusion as any officer, Duran Fitz, District Attorney of Los Angeles. Mr. Fitz. Thank you, Chief Davis. I can add a little to what the Chief has already said other than this. Every man worked on a 24-hour shift. Few of us had our clothes off or any sleep for a week, from, from a week tonight until Mr. Gettle was returned to his family 48 hours ago. Our happiness is a job well done and a reunion between the victim and his family. As law enforcement officers, we are particularly glad that Los Angeles County still has an unblemished record in kidnapping cases. This is the seventh case with the kidnappers either hanged or in San Quentin for life. Never in my 15 years as a prosecutor have I seen the federal government, the sheriff's office, the police department, and this office pull unitedly together as in this case. It was solved for that reason, and future cooperation of this type will continue to make Los Angeles a hot place for kidnappers. Thank you, Mr. Pitt. And now, may the man whose case it was, Sheriff Jean Biscalou of Los Angeles County. Thanks, Chief. That was a charming gesture. True, the ghetto case was a county case, but it is doubtful if success would have come as rapidly and as entirely without the skill, resourcefulness, and untiring efforts of the men under your command and those of federal forces and other police departments in cooperation with the sheriffs of Southern County and California Highway Patrol and many others, too numerous to mention. Thank you, Sheriff Biskelos. And now, Federal Investigator Reed Vetterly, assigned to the case by the United States government. The new law on kidnapping brought the United States Department of Justice into the ghetto case. The successful solution of this case was the result of perfect coordination on the part of all law enforcement agencies. With proper coordination, crime cannot flourish in any community, and it shall be the purpose of our department to continue such cooperation. Thank you. And now, friends, you've heard the men who directed the hunt for Mr. Gettle and his captors. Later in the program, you will hear Mr. Gettle himself and his faithful friend, Attorney Ernest Noon, but first. The true story of the ghetto kidnapping. It is just a week ago tonight. A warm midnight breeze caresses the lacy green leaves of the pepper trees and rattles the stiff fronds of the tall palms. The lazy song of a night bird drifts across the lovely garden of the Gettle Estate in Arcadia, a suburb of Los Angeles. The guests, who have spent a pleasant evening at Bridge, have all retired, all but one, James T. Wolfe, who has joined his host for a cigarette in the recreation house behind the mansion. Certainly is a lovely place you have here, Bill. 
Yes, I've dreamed of building this house for years. And finally, it's all completed, even to the swimming pool. Are you going to enjoy that if this hot weather keeps up? Oh, well, there I will. But it's the kids that will get the most out of it. Yes, I certainly have a paradise to play in here. That's tremendously important, Jim, to give the kids a safe place to play. You know, ever since the Lindbergh kidnapping, I've been worried about those kids of mine. Yes, that was a terrible thing. That's the reason for the barbed wire on top of the concrete wall around the place. That's the reason for the electrically operated gate. I want this place to be safe for my kids. Well, you've done a pretty good job, Bill. Yes, I think I have. Well, it's getting late, almost 12. Shall we go in? Okay. Well, I'm pretty tired, too. This way, Jim, it's shorter. Pick him up, gentlemen. Hey, what is it? Keep quiet. Can't you see this gun? Now put your hands up. Over your heads. Walk over toward the wall. If ain't a high, it's just snatch. Well, listen, boys. My wife's back there in the house. She's sick. Come on back there with me. I've got a lot of money in the safe. I've got a hundred dollars or more in my pocketbook. Mm. Take it and get out, will you? <laughs> listen, fella. Everything you got in the house ain't enough. I said this was a kidnapping. Kidnapping? Take off your necktie. Here, Roy, tie this guy. I'll trip up Mr. Gettle. Right. <coughs> there. That ought to hold you. Now, let's have that adhesive tape. Here you are. Well. There. No, no, no Roy. Right across the mouth like oh, this. Oh, I get it. Yeah. There, that's better. All right, Mr. Gettle. Up the ladder here and over the wall. And you, mister. Stay right where you are for an hour. Or else we'll come back and bump you off. Come on, pal. Let's go. Look out. He's slipping. Oh, come on. Hurry up. Hurt, Mr. Gettle. Oh, I think my leg's broken. Here, let me see. Where's it hurt you? There. Oh, I'll rub it. It'll be all right in a minute. Oh, sir. Oh, sir. Uh, how's that? No, I don't know. Well, come on. We've got to get you out of here. Give me a hand with him, pal. Okay. There we are. All right. Lean on my shoulder. We'll get you over to the car. There. All right, Roy. Let's get going. <laughs> Police calling all cars, attention all cars, attention all cars, the sheriff's office. William F. Gettle had been kidnapped from his home in Arcadia by two men, described as American, five feet nine or ten inches, weighing about 160 pounds. The victim was attired in gray flannel trousers, a light tan shirt, tennis shoes. He wore gold rimmed glasses. Go get them, boys. That's all. Go to work. W.G. Lutzi. I was a guest at the Gettle home until 5 o'clock yesterday afternoon. When I left the grounds, I saw a young woman sitting in the car by the gate. And when she saw me, she drove away as fast as she could. I'm Paul Service. I live across the way from Gettle's place. Last night at 9 o'clock, I heard a shot. I'm the red turnbull, the outboard motorboat champion. Yesterday, I too received a kidnapping then. I'm carrying a gun. I'm S.C. E. Lock. Several times last week, I saw an automobile bearing an Illinois license plate past the Gettle home. I am the citizen of Arcadia. I heard a man screaming at midnight last night. I'm a man on the street. I think the Gettle kidnapping is the work of the Dillinger gang. I'm a housewife, and I believe the criminals who kidnapped Mr. Gettle are the same things that kidnapped that poor Robles baby over in Tucson. I'm Ernest Newton, and I've been authorized by Mrs. Gettle to act as intermediary. I will deal with the kidnappers independently. Owing to the serious condition of Mrs. Gettle, who has been ill for a considerable time, I ask that the kidnappers do not unnecessarily delay reaching me. This is the only official statement from Mrs. Gettle. She has made no statement herself. I'm Boron Fitz. I'm the district attorney of Los Angeles. I've ordered every man connected with my office to get on the job 24 hours a day. 
With my office as the clearinghouse for information, I'm asking every citizen who might observe a suspicious movement to call it to our attention. We believe that we're in a position to conduct a search for the kidnappers, which will be as widespread and ultimately as successful as the search for that other notorious kidnapper, Eddie Hickman. Such are the rumors, statements, garbled, welter of evidence, and clear-cut expression of legal policy which developed in the first 12 hours after the abduction of Mr. Gettle. Then, as Reed Federley, federal agent, arrives in San Francisco, as Chief Davis offers the complete facilities of the Los Angeles Police Department, Sheriff Gene Biscalouse of Los Angeles County summons police chiefs from more than 40 Southern California cities to his office for a council of war. Boys, Gettle's safety is our paramount consideration. We are running down obvious clues and checking suspicious characters, of course, but we are making no attempt to interfere with ransom negotiations. You have heard Mr. Noon's request. Though we have promised not to uh, interfere with the ransom negotiations, we can intensify our activities on all stakeouts and investigations now being conducted. In other words, gentlemen... Until we deliver Gettle back to his family, no one is above suspicion. On Friday morning, a ransom note arrives at the E.F. Hutton Company in Beverly Hills addressed to Bill Drews, a friend of Gettle. At 6 o'clock that evening, a second ransom note is delivered to Noon, demanding a $60,000 ransom and instructing Noon to be in readiness to deliver the money in a Ford Coupe with the right door removed and the turtle back taken out. During the day, erroneous reports spread throughout Los Angeles that the kidnappers are demanding $75,000. And three telephone calls reported to be from the kidnappers are placed into Noon's office during the day. None of these convinces Noon that he's in touch with the actual kidnappers. Then, Saturday afternoon at 3 o'clock, Noon receives a telephone call which proves through code arranged in the ransom letter to be a genuine telephone contact with the kidnappers. In this note, Mr. Noon is instructed to stand by for further instructions. He hurries over to the ghetto town house in Beverly Hills with the news. In the sun-filled garden of the ghetto mansion, the four children of the kidnapped millionaire, Billy and Betty, the twins, aged eight, Bobby six, and Jimmy four, are playing, all unmindful of the horrible plight of their father. In the darkened room on the first floor, Mrs. Jeffel receives Mr. Noon. Oh, Mr. Noon. Is there any news? Uh, yes, Mrs. Gettle. I've just received a call from a man who calls himself Percy. And that's the way the ransom note I got last night said the message would be delivered. Oh, what did he say? Well, he said to hold myself in readiness for further instructions. Oh, Mr. Noon. Oh, do you think he's all right? I have every confidence that he'll be back soon. Oh, I hope so. Oh, I'm sure he will. But, Mrs. Gettle, you have no right being up. You should be in bed. Oh, no, no. I'm all right. Oh, if only those terrible people would stay away. Who? The sightseers? Yes. Well, there's little you can do about them. They have no, no feeling. All day long, autos have driven past the house. All day long, those crowds on the lawn. Yes, and there are quite a few police here today. Yes, but... Oh, they've been so good. They've not interfered with our attempts. Well, I'm glad to know that. Oh, how, how thoughtless of me. Those poor officers out there in the sun. Hilda. Yes, Mrs. Gettle. Hilda, uh, take some lemonade to the officers out in the patio, please. Yes, Mrs. Gettle, right away. Mama, Mama, I want my daddy. Where's daddy? Now, Billy, now run out and play with your little brothers and sisters. But where's daddy, Mama? Your, your daddy's gone away for a few days on, on business. Who would he be back, Mama? Why, he should be back. And any day now. <laughs> Later in the day, noon receives a call in his office. This is Percy. Have you got the money? Yes, but 
I'm not satisfied with the signature. Well, what do you want me to do about that? Now, look here. If you're really on the level, and you are holding Bill Gettle, ask him these questions. First, what did I play with on my one and only trip to the ranch? And second, who was in the automobile on that trip? Okay, I'll call you back. Mr. Noon did not expect to hear from the kidnappers until the following day, but at 2 a.m. Sunday morning... Hello. This is Percy. The answer to the first question is a green parrot. The answer to the second question is Lucy Richard, Gettle, yourself, and another man were in that car. All right. I'm convinced you're the man to deal with. Okay. I'll call you tomorrow afternoon at your office. Mr. Noon confers with the Bank of America through Mr. Charles E. Carrillo, and the bank agrees to forward the money for the ransom. Two employees are kept on duty all day Sunday to provide the money. Early Sunday afternoon, the intermediary receives another telephone call. Noon speaking. Have you received a letter? Yes. Have you got the money? Yes, I can get it when necessary. You have $50,000? Yes. Have you got it with you? No, but I can get it whenever you want it. Well... I'll call you at 8 o'clock and tell you what to do. Mr. Noon remains steadfastly at his post during the hot Sunday afternoon. Late in the day, Chief of Detective Joe Taylor calls on him. Good afternoon, Mr. Noon. Good afternoon, Chief. Well, uh, what do you know? Anything new? No, nothing much. Listen, Mr. Noon, don't you think it's about time to let this truce go and start after these birds? No, no, not yet. But why not? Nothing's happened. Why, Chief Davis and Sheriff Biscalese have got an organization worked out that'll sweep Southern California like a swarm of locusts. They couldn't escape our dragnet. Yes, and Bill Gettle would never get out of it alive. How do you know he is still alive? Well, I feel sure he is. Come on, Mr. Noon, something's happened. What is it? Well, I may as well tell you, Chief. I'm waiting for definite orders from the kidnappers. They've agreed to $60,000, and they're to call me at 8 o'clock. They have? Yes. Uh, pardon me a moment. Certainly. Uh, hello? Uh, I have instructions, Lou. Yes? Got a Ford coupe. Yeah? Well, you told me about that in your letter. Yeah, I know I did, but I wanted to get it right. It's well, that... the right-hand door. Yeah. Get the money, and when we call you tonight, come alone. Very well. Something hot? Yes. I'm to get the money and follow instructions when they phone me. Uh, when will that be? Eight o'clock, they said. Listen, Mr. Noon, do you know uh, what those monkeys are liable to do? No, what? Well, they're liable to give you a rush call to some place way out in the valley, and you'll be hijacked at that door before you get there if they don't bump you off in the bargain. Well, I'm not afraid of that as long as I get Bill back. Yes, but that sort of stuff wouldn't get him back anyway, and you'd lose the dough and maybe your life, and he'd still be where he is now. Oh, what do you propose? Let me put one of my men in the car. Well, what would I tell the kidnappers? Tell them anything. Tell them that they wouldn't let you have the money yourself and that you have to send someone from the bank. Well, I'll, I'll think it over. <laughs> Acting in the hope that Mr. Noon will see the rhythm of his plan, Chief Taylor dispatches 50 police radio cars with two men to each throughout the various substations in the city. Then he selects Blaney Matthews of the district attorney's squad to drive the ransom car. All plans laid, each district captain provided with his instructions. Each radio car carrying a map of the sections is expected to patrol. Chief Taylor returns to Mr. Noon's office Sunday evening. Eight o'clock comes and goes. Nine o'clock. Ten o'clock. Eleven o'clock pass by. And then, at 11.30... Hello? Hello, Lou. This is Percy. Yes? Where is it? In the car, but I can't bring it. Why not? Well, they won't let me handle it. I've got to send someone from the bank. Well, get this, Lou. I don't give a damn who brings the money. Send a cover if you like. This is anything you want of it. Get that dough for it. All right. Now, get this. Tell your man to come over Coenga Pass to Laurel Canyon. Halfway up the canyon, and you'll find a stake with a handkerchief. At the foot of the stake, you'll find a letter with instructions. Very well. Get that dough to it and get it to us right away. Blaney Matthews drives the ransom car, followed at a quarter mile by a police car. Weaving through the swift traffic of Coenga Pass, he finally reaches the canyon and turns into the blackness of the country road. The soft hills looming above him. Driving carefully, he watches for the stake, sees it, stops the car, finds the letter, reads it, drops it on the road, and drives on. The tail car swiftly approaches the spot where Matthews had dropped the note. There's the note. Pick it up, Fred. I got it. Let's get out of here fast. Okay. What to say? Turn you 
flashlight on. Yeah, thanks. It says, go down Crenshaw Boulevard to Florence. Go east to Alameda. And south on Alameda to Firestone. Drive slow. Not over 20 miles an hour all the time. At Firestone, you will find another handkerchief with a letter. That means we got to get to the nearest phone and send that dope into headquarters. The setting for a thrilling detective story is laid. Cryptic messages in the dead of night. Instructions carried out to the letter. The story runs on in perfect form as Chief Davis, allowing Matthews time to get into the hot area, dispatches his 50 police cars to blockade every cross street and boulevard in the region of Firestone and Alameda. The tactics work perfectly. But the kidnappers do not appear to claim the ransom. Discouraged, the strategists of the Peace Force are required to develop a new line of attack. But at this point, the story takes an unexpected turn. For several weeks, Chief Taylor has had a dictaphone planted in the apartment of a gang of suspected bank robbers. From the adjoining apartment, Detective Lieutenant H.P. Gerhardt and W.C. Burris, after their patient vigil, at last hear snatch a significant conversation. Oh, 
Let your bigger head start to run after him, but we'll pick him up soon enough. Oh, let's find Mr. Gettle. Hey! Let's find Mr. Gettle. Hey! Hey there! Hey! He's in here! He's in here! He's in here! He's in here! Well, Mr. Gettle, you don't know how glad we are to see you. Boys, you don't know how glad I am to see you. How bet. Here, wait like I cut these ropes first here. Here, wait like I cut these ropes first here. Here, wait like I cut these ropes first here. There. Well, we got two of your kidnapping friends, sir, and it won't be long until we get the third. Good. And now can we go? Can I go back to... to my family? My family? To my family? My family? Lieutenant Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Please attention all cars. Attention all cars to Sheriff's Office. Pick up Larry Kerrigan. Warrant for ghetto kidnapping. Described as 28 or 30 years of age. Five feet nine inches tall. Has reddish hair. Stellar complexion. Hair. Stellar complexion. Slender. Bring him in. That's all. Rose. That's all. Rose and Clark. That's all, Rosenquist. That's all, Rosenquist. Oh, Rosenquist. Rosenquist. Detective Bureau, Captain Stensland talking. Oh, uh, you are Larry Kerrigan, don't you? Do I? I'll say I do. Where is he? Over here on North Broadway. <laughs> Kerrigan is quickly apprehended and arrested. Kerrigan is quickly apprehended and arrested, and quickly he confesses. Williams, too, confesses, and both men implicate Kirk. The alleged brains of the kidnapping mob is brought into Sheriff Bisloo's office and made to listen to his colleagues' confessions before a room full of police officers. Well, Kirk, you've heard the statements of these men. Have you anything to say? Sure, it's just a lot of lies. I don't know why they're trying to bring me into it. Is there anything to add to these statements? Yeah. Yeah. Will somebody take these cuffs off of me and let me take care of those two dirty school pigeons? Is there anything you want to add to their statements, sir? Their statements, sir. Add to their statements, sir. Oh, nuts. What's the use? It's all true. Everything they said's true. Just 24 hours ago, the grand jury returned an indictment accusing Kirk, Williams, and Kerrigan of kidnapping Mr. Gettle. And Kerrigan of kidnapping Mr. Gettle. Kerrigan of kidnapping Mr. Gettle. Fourteen minutes later, the three men stand before Judge Fritchie. He reads the indictment to them and then pronounces judgment. <coughs> judgment. <coughs> Roy Williams, Jimmy Fred Kirk, Larry Kerrigan. It is the judgment of this court that you be confined in San Quentin prison for the rest of your natural life. And at this moment, the three kidnappers are speeding north to prison. The greatest manhunt in the history of California is the history of California is at a successful end. And California's reputation is still spotless. For never has a kidnapper in California successfully escaped the penitentiary. The penitentiary. Escaped the penitentiary. And now, friends, before we leave you tonight, I want to introduce to you Mr. Ernest Noon, faithful friend of Mr. Gettle, a man whose head never touched the pillow from last Wednesday until last night when he knew that Bill Gettle, his friend, was safe. Mr. Noon. If it were not for you, Chief Davis, you, Jordan Fitz, and you, Gene Biscalouz, and the rest of you, including the Department of Justice agents, I doubt Bill Gettle and myself would be alive today. I say this because Kirk has admitted that he fairly intended to kill the man who drove the money car. Sometimes I wonder if the people who perpetrate such crimes realize the mis misery they cause. Sometimes I wonder if you out there who hear my voice realize it after you read the sob stories about such vicious criminals. There is only one sort of payment, but then I am not the law. I am only a lawyer. But I am sure you want to hear from Bill Gettle himself. You want to hear from Bill Gettle himself. 
must hear from Bill Gettle himself, who from Bill Gettle himself, who thanks to God and the splendid cooperation which I have had from organized law enforcement agencies, including our own Beverly Hills Police Chief Charlie Blair, who placed his entire force at my disposal, has once more been returned to us, none the worse for his experience. Thank you all. You'll have to pardon me. You'll have to pardon me as I'm still a little weak and rather rather not talk about the last few days. I've only come down here tonight because I want to publicly thank everyone who up to, who up the great light, greater part of my life, the opportunity to return to my family. I also hope this purpose this purpose will give others the same admiration for the forces of the law. I have gained in this rather awful affair, uh, it's in a little life or dream, that I have this broadcasting studio tonight to go home again and thank you. And thank you, Mr. Gettle, Chief Davis, District Attorney Fitz, Sheriff Discalouse, and all you other kind people who have given of your time to make this momentous broadcast possible. The Rio Grande Oil Company sincerely hopes that we shall never again be able to broadcast such a program because to get such a story would mean that some other fine citizen would have to suffer as did Mr. Getter. broadcast possible. This is Frederick Lindsley saying good night for the Rio Grande Oil Company. <laughs> <laughs>